Hello everyone, MarshW13 here, and I invite you to join me on a tour of the Museum of Flight in Seattle, Washington. When people think of aviation attractions in the Seattle area, the Boeing factory in Everett, 40 miles to the north, probably comes to mind, but there is in fact an even better museum that covers a lot more ground and is just 8 miles from the Seattle-Tacoma Airport. And given its location at Boeing Field in Seattle, there is of course a lot of Boeing content in this museum, but it covers so much more across a wide swath of the aviation spectrum, both geographically and historically, including this German Taube glider from 1910. Now most of the aircraft can be found in this glass enclosed main exhibit hall, beautifully sunlit. This here is a reproduction of the 1903 Wright Flyer, also known as the Kitty Hawk, the first heavier than air powered aircraft which made its inaugural flight in North Carolina in December of 1903. And next up is a Boeing Model 40, a post-World War I aircraft designed for mail delivery that made its maiden flight in 1925. This was really Boeing's first highly successful foray into the highly lucrative realm of commercial aviation. And who can resist the iconically sleek lines of the A-12MD, a member of the Blackbird family of reconnaissance aircraft built by Lockheed to fly at speeds in excess of Mach 3 from the 1960s through the 90s. This is an M-21, a two-seat variant of the A-12. The Boeing 80A commemorates the Boeing company's transition from cargo to passenger transport. This 18-passenger variant was introduced in the early 1930s. And inside the Boeing 80A, you will find a heated cabin with leather seats just as comfortable, really, as the modern jet of today. And we don't have time to cover each aircraft individually, but as you make your journey through aviation history in this museum, you'll see biplanes like this one. There's a Curtis Robin C1 from the 1930s, candy apple red. A Stinson Model O, 30s era military trainer. And I think this is a Lockheed Electra, similar to that piloted by Amelia Earhart when she disappeared tragically in 1937. This is a Vought XF-8U-1 Crusader, a highly successful 50s era fighter jet that became the first to exceed 1,000 miles per hour. And check out this MiG-15 modified by the Chinese with a more powerful engine than the original. And although this museum may not be the most interactive, there are a couple of jet cockpits the guests are permitted to enter, including this one, which I believe was a military trainer. And although the instrumentation is covered in plexiglass, 
the control stick is exposed and mobile. And you can also enter what appears to be a Blackbird flight deck. Just be careful if you have old bones, but it's truly worth it to climb on board. You'll probably have a line of guests queuing up behind you to take selfies in these cockpits, but it's a wonderfully authentic experience. And here we have another Cold War era jet, a MiG-21. This particular specimen flew as part of the Czech Air Force and was retired with the fall of the Iron Curtain. And here we have an early generation 737 painted in U.S. Air livery. Which we'll explore in a moment, but first... Let's enjoy another shot of the museum's absolutely exquisite Blackbird specimen. Amazingly, this remains the fastest and highest flying aircraft ever built, and it was conceived in 1959. And as we move past those incredibly powerful Pratt and Whitney J58 turbojet engines that compensate for supersonic air intake. Just a beautiful aircraft. Next up, I believe, is a F-4C Phantom, a fighter jet produced by McDonnell that became the U.S. Navy's dominant interceptor aircraft in the 60s, replaced only when the F-15 came along in the late 1970s. And then we have a Huey, as the Bell Iroquois helicopters were known. These were popularized during the Vietnam War. Now back to the U.S. Air 737. this time from a slightly higher angle. And from the exterior, it's clear that the flight deck, if we peer in the windows here, is fully intact and should be a treat to explore more closely. And in fact, the 737 fuselage is open to museum desks. You just walk right in across the bridge. And uh, it features what appears to be an 80s or 90s era interior with an all domestic first class or business class if you prefer layout. And uh, there are overhead screens playing vintage commercial aviation content. Looks to be at least 40 inches of seat pitch there. No tray tables. And just check out the 737 Classic flight deck with fully analog instruments. Very much a throwback to the early 1980s before glass cockpits became standard. Don't forget this museum is located on the grounds of a working airport, Boeing Field, and there is a control tower exhibit here that depicts various elements of air traffic control and also provides live runway views and ATC audio to match. And we have a couple of aircraft taking off towards the southeast. This was um, actually Seattle's primary commercial airport prior to the construction of SeaTac. And there aren't a lot of passenger operations here today, but Boeing has some facilities. And they continue to perform delivery preparations for newly assembled aircraft at this airport, including, I believe, the 737 MAX. Mm -hmm. 
There's also a space exhibit that includes several space vehicles, including this Apollo Command Module, which is quite vividly lit on the interior, as you can see. Then the Boeing Story exhibit covers the history of the Boeing Company from its inception in 1916 through 1958. And it is housed in the original Boeing factory, with this first story having been largely restored to its original shop room floor luster. So you can see how the earliest Boeing fuselages were designed and built. And there is a second floor, but I recall having been there on a previous visit and having sent something a little spooky upstairs. So I'm avoiding that on this visit. Now essentially the other half of the museum is located on the other side of the street which you can reach via this bridge over Marginal Way and those other exhibits to which I am referring are housed primarily in an open air space called the Aviation Pavilion. We'll see in a moment. But before you get to the pavilion you visit an indoor exhibit called the Space Gallery and there you will see a NASA fuselage trainer which is a full scale mock-up of the space shuttle. This training module was used to train astronauts in Houston. And if you climb the stairs adjoining the shuttle, you can visit its cargo bay. But on to the Aviation Pavilion, which houses well over a dozen aircraft, including jumbo jets like this 747-100 series jet constructed in 1969. This specimen is truly an exceptional piece of commercial aviation history as it was the first 747 ever built and it flew 5,300 hours as a tester, finally retiring in 1995. And next we go from Boeing's earliest jumbo to its newest original wide body, the 787. And this specific plane designated ZA-003 was the third Dreamliner ever built and you can see the tail number B787BX. Boeing toured this aircraft around the globe in introducing the world to the Dreamliner. Like around half of the planes here in the pavilion, there are boarding stairs, which we're climbing. And as a demonstration version that toured the world, this uh, 787 is outfitted with the stock Recaro business class seats, very similar to the ones adopted by United Continental airlines for their 787s and there's a video there describing the heads up display in the flight deck speaking of the flight deck it is viewable and surprisingly it is powered on which is amazing so you get to see the integrated flat screen multifunction displays in operation The MCP. I can't tell what are those HUDs are on from this angle. And here's a view of the economy cabin of the 787. I also went back and visited the 747 interior, which, remember, was a veteran flight test bed for many years. So you see a lot of the original diagnostics equipment on board. Here we have a DC-2 produced in the 30s for TWA as a competitor to the Boeing 247. You can also visit Air Force One, not the current or future 747 variants, but rather the original 707-based VC 137B introduced in the 1950s. This specific plane carried JFK, LBJ, and Nixon, and you can tour the interior. And finally, the Concorde. This specific aircraft was delivered to British Airways 
in 1980 and was used in that airline's last commercial Concorde flight in 2003. Not surprisingly, it also managed to break the New York to Seattle speed record on its delivery flight to this very museum. And there is so much more to see in the Museum of Flight, including this exhibit covering both World Wars I and II. But the bottom line here is that this museum combines an experience that rivals the greatest aeronautical museums in the world with an accessible location being just a couple of miles away from SeaTac and a 15-minute Uber ride from downtown Seattle. I think it's convenient for tourists, and it is an absolute must for anyone who has even a passing interest in, in aviation. In fact, I think if I had to choose between the Museum of Flight and the Boeing Factory Tour in Everett, it would be a tough choice. The only solution, of course, is to see both, although the Boeing Factory Tour closed for COVID. So I highly recommend a visit on your next trip to the Seattle area to the Museum of Flight. Hope to see you there. Until then, Marsh W13 out.